Hi everyone, thank you for joining me today. Um, my name is Robin Kidd. I'm the General Counsel and Head of Managed Document Review at Law & Order. Um, I'll be taking you through this course on discovery and technology um, as part of your gathering evidence course at the University of WA. So what we're going to go through today, um, what is document review? It's, you, know, you might hear the buzzwords around, but uh, this is what it's going to be like in practice. Um, what does it look like for a lawyer today? And um, we're also going to touch on what is e-discovery and how can technology assist with document review? And, you know, the burning question, what do you actually do in document review? We're going to, we're going to get there, don't worry. Um, also, how and when practitioners should use a review platform. Don't worry if you don't know what review platforms are, we're going to get to that too. So, what is document review? Start from the basics. So document review is, as it says, uh, the collection and review of documentary evidence and data for several purposes. So the first and probably most important is understanding and building your case. So your case for your client, making sure you know where all the bodies are buried, making sure you know the stories that build um, your case, you knowing that intricate detail um, and making sure there are no clients in your own case that are going to trip you up later on. Um, it will also help you prepare your witness statements and prepare, for example, your expert brief too. So another reason that you want to review the documentary evidence is when you're responding to discovery requests from the other side of your dispute. And these can uh, be quite arduous sometimes um, and will require a lot of thought um, and can, uh, can be one of the reasons why people dread document review. Um, really, it's not that bad, honestly. Um, the other reason you might want to be doing a uh, document review is responding to subpoenas. So this um, can happen if you are either party to an action in court or also if you're not party to an action. So you can have non-party disclosure when you are tangentially refer referred to or involved in the matter um, but not party to the proceedings and you can have a subpoena served upon you. So you will still have to hand over all those documents and uh, risk not being contempt of court for failing to hand over the docs. So when you're reviewing the documents, you will review for relevance to the proceedings and also privilege and some other bits and pieces, but we'll come to that later on. So what does it look like for lawyers to do document review? Now, this, this horrific image here, this is what it used to look like. Folds and folds and folders, boxes and boxes and boxes, tears at uh, bedtime for all the documents there. You might have seen similar on uh, TV shows uh, featuring a certain royal. Um, that's not really what it looks like anymore though. So this, here we go. This is a vision of the future, how things are now. So you've got a little happy lawyer there at the top. She's uh, happily clicking away on her review platform. Sometimes, you know, the hours get a bit late, so she might be there to the wee small hours of the, of the morning, clicking away also. And given that everybody uh, is working from home just now, you've got the work from home set up at the bottom there and with a very, very young paralegal with his own small desk, which I'm sure is OHS compliant. So what um, the previous version of life looked like is lots of hard copies. So that was the predominant source of the information in your dispute and would be uh, reviewed in hard copy as well. You would then photocopy it all and hand it over to court to the other side. Now, however, there's an increased volume of electronically stored information, so ESI. So if you are going to court, you are likely to have to be plundering people's email mailboxes. You are going to be taking scans of websites. You are going to be taking copies of corporate servers. If you have, uh, like any of us, had discussions um, about workplace issues or your matters or anything, uh, think of the amount of conversations you have you know, offline, um, but they're in iMessage and text message. You're going to have to have your phone scanned and take those messages as well. You will have to be looking at extracts from WeChat and WhatsApp. You will also have extracts from Office 365, so your likes of um, Teams chat. Uh, if you are just sending random emails, um, everyone is working from home now, so all the Office 365 um, data is all centrally stored in the server. Um, as I say, you're going to have Teams messages, Slack messages, Zoom chats, everything. You can even have drone data as part of the data that you are having to review. We have had a case that involved that. Now, what is e-discovery when it comes to document review? So e-discovery is uh, basically taking your discovery that used to be pouring over files and files and files to files, 
Um, you're now going to put this onto a review platform and use technology to help you get through. So this will help you using the discovery platform will help you manage and handle the ESI. You'll be using a consultant to help you do it, who's your technical wizard to get you through. And as I say, you are working on a review platform. Now there are thousands of review platforms out there. Relativity and UX Discover are two of the biggest ones in the market. They are two that are predominantly used in Australia. Um, so if you guys have done any grad work or um, are looking into grad opportunities or paralegal opportunities, you're likely going to hear of Relativity or UX Discover pretty soon. Um, if anyone doesn't know, you discover used to be referred to as Ringtail, so you may have that name in your nightmares also. So how can technology help you? I mean, how is it better to be reviewing something online or on a computer rather than just reviewing it in hard copy? Surely it's easier to flick through pages. Well, it's not really like that. So a lot of courts now are pushing towards electronic review to um, make it more efficient and uh, help uh, litigation move sm more smoothly. So the other thing is that if you have all the data in an electronic format, it helps you to gather the information more efficiently and eliminate it more efficiently so that you're only reviewing the docs you have to review. This also, by keeping the documentation online, makes litigation fast, cheap and efficient, which is the driver through the Australian legal system. So judicial acceptance of technology. Now, unfortunately, you guys in WA, you don't have your very own practice note. You guys, uh, all the other states do. So New South Wales, Victoria, Queensland, and even the Northern Territory have all got practice notes which basically push parties towards the use of technology. The New South Wales practice note uh, for the Supreme Court says that any um, matter that has over 500 documents in electronic storage information should move online, so should be done on an electronic review platform. Any matter that is being disclosed in court should be produced in an electronic format. That is the real driver here. Now, as you can see in the federal court practice note the, at the bottom of the page there, that's the big driver there to use analytics, which is, uh, we'll come to in a minute, but um, helping you minimize the use of, um, minimize documents you don't have to review, save time, save costs, and get everyone through. So one of the big drivers is to not make litigation um, prohibitively expensive so that one party can snowball another with thousands and millions of documents and then prevent them from actually being able to pursue their claims in court because there's just too many documents to get through. Okay, so one of the other benefits of technology, aside from the courts really encouraging us to get there, is that it helps you collect data and eliminate it more quickly. So if you have to go and get, um, say, three parties' mailboxes, that's, um, we refer to their mailboxes as PST files. Um, now, if you have three people and they're all talking to each other a lot, you don't necessarily need to see every single copy of every email that goes between them. So if I emailed um, you know, everyone who's uh, listening to the class today, we would have umpteen copies of the exact same email if we took everyone's mailboxes. You don't need to review that. You do not need to do that. Old school, if you're doing a hard copy, you would often find the same document again and again and again, copied to different folders, and you would know you'd seen it and you'd have to make sure it was coded effectively and it was coded consistently as well. Now, if you have this on an electronic platform, you can deduplicate. So that email that I sent out has got the same MD5 hash value as all the ones that would be in everyone else's mailboxes. So 32 digit code, which you don't really need to know, um, but you can deduplicate that. So just like that, you have got the countless copies of the same email. Now, if you can imagine that paired out across multiple mailboxes, that's a really massive time saver. Um, you can also run keyword searching. So you can't do keyword searching across hard copy documents. This doesn't work. But if you have electronic data, you can um, run these keyword searches over not just one file at a time. So not just you know, looking for uh, control F in a one PDF file at a time or one Word doc at a time. You can run it across hundreds of thousands of documents at one time. And you can also run multiple keyword searches all at once to narrow down your field. So you can make sure that you're looking, for example, the right project, the right people, the right context, um, all through keyword searches. You can also date cull. So sometimes you might get lucky and your hard copy information might be um, put in nice little folders, which tells you where the dates begin and end in the folders, but often you're just you know, going through hordes of paper and boxes. With date culling, you're able to use the electronically stored information and the metadata that file contains to cull the dates. So if you're really looking for three months in 2016 in relation to this deal that's gone sour, 
you don't need to have someone's inbox from now till the dawn of time. You can get rid of that, call to the relevant period, and therefore you've reduced the whole load of dogs. You can also make sure you're getting all the right custodians. So custodians is the name that we give to the people who own the mailboxes. So you can make sure that you've got all their right data. So you've got all the right people involved. You don't need to be collecting data for people that are irrelevant. That just increases your time and increases the cost of discovery. So those are some of the benefits of electronic review um, over hard copy review. I will also say that what if you've still got hard copy in your review? Well, all those documents can be scanned. You can put them through OCR. So that's optical character recognition. So you can still control F in these new copies. And then you can have them objectively coded. So that means that all those documents are now going to have the electronically searchable and you'll be able to look at the date of them, the title, who is it to and from, um, and look at the content of those documents as well. So you don't have to worry about your hard copy being uh, left behind or having to do an electronic review and a hard copy review. Moving on. More things that technology can do. So even when you reduce your document set, you can also still have to do some pretty time consuming tasks. So for example, you discover that there's foreign language docs in your material. Now, I don't know about you, but I definitely can't speak every language under the sun. So machine translation can really help you out there. I mean, you don't necessarily need to go to the expensive step of hiring foreign language paralegals or alternatively having to uh, work them all out yourself. And um, you can also have audio and video files transcribed, which is very useful, which means you can also run keyword searches across them. Or if you're doing redaction, so blocking out privileged bits of information or confidential bits of information, you can actually run algorithms through your programs if you give them a few different keywords and searches um, to apply redaction across these documents for you. Um, otherwise, it can be a really labor intensive process. The old school way was to do a marker across the page, then scan it in, and then that was your copy of your uh, redacted copy of the document. No more. Don't worry about that anymore. Okay. So you can use, uh, you can reduce your document set with material management. So you can do all that deduplicating, keyword searching, date culling and things. You can also use your workflow management um, to make things a little bit faster. Um, but you can also use analytics. Now analytics is uh, the hottest and sexiest tool out there now um, to help you uh, get early insights into your data and also prioritize relevant documents. So giving you a few of my favorite toys in analytics, the first is email threading. So if we had that email that I've sent to all of you, uh, and if we all bounced that back and forth, replied a bit, now we don't need to review every single email that's bounced back and forth between us. What that is called is called an email thread. So really, all you need to do is review the email at the very end of the chain, and then you know all the content of the rest of it. Now, if one of you forwarded uh, the email chain that we we're having, that main discussion, forwarded it onto another classmate, now that would create a new thread. So with email threading and analytics, it wouldn't get rid of that thread because it would have different content. However, it would prioritize it in the review next to the original thread. Therefore, when you are going through and reviewing these documents, you'd be like, oh, I know what that one says. It, up to this point, it was all category Y, da, 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 and saying all oh, about this thing. Now I need to review this new section, this section that's been an offshoot from the original conversation. So very handy, helps you get your insights into your data quicker. Now that can give you a 20 to 30% reduction in your email set. Now, obviously that's a huge benefit when you're short on time, short on resources, and really don't want to be reviewing extra documents, which no one does. You can also use near duplicate identification. So for example, um, if I uh, sent this email to all of you, now we printed out that email. That email would not automatically deduplicate against this email that we've printed. Um, even if you scanned it in, because it would not have that MD5 hash value. However, near dupe identification works on the basis of the text content, so that OCRing that we were talking about earlier. Now, these documents would be grouped together, um, and then you would be able to get that uh, increased speed review and accuracy. You can also use this for QA and for privilege checks to make sure that similar documents are coded in a similar way. Um, you can also use clustering, um, grouping documents based on concepts and not just keywords. For example, if I wanted to look up all the documents based on Christmas, um, I would put in Christmas, I would put in Jingle Bells, and then looking at clustering, clustering would say, well, actually, um, those documents that you're, you're looking for with those keywords, they also contain Santa, they contain snow, or in Australia, they contain barbecue. So um, 
it would say, do you want to have a look at these documents too? It would also say that, oh, documents that you're looking for, there's all these batch of documents here that all talk about Halloween. Is that something you're interested in? Or if it's not something you're interested in, you know that you don't have to review those documents at all. So that's great. So you can use it to include and exclude large groups of docs. Language identification, pretty self-explanatory. Um, 170 languages are supported by the primary review platforms at the minute, unless you get add-ons. This can also help um, assess effectiveness of keywords. Um, and helps you early plan your translation requirements if you are not using a, um, a machine translation solution. Okay, apologies for the very Sydney-centric graphic. Um, but using analytics um, on a 6.6 .6 million document set, using some technical wizardry and 31 hours, reducing that set to 157,000 documents. Now, I'm sure I can tell you that you would definitely prefer to review 157,000 rather than 6.6 .6 million. Okay, now predictive coding, or as it's known, technology assistant review, is the, uh, the very latest, the very sexiest in uh, document review. Now, it is not Skynet, it is not uh, the machines doing all the coding for you, so don't worry, you're not wasting your law degree getting a law degree, it's still gonna have jobs for lawyers. What it is, is it leverages manual review by humans, and then applies the machine coding decisions across the wider review tool. So, very similar to um, using Spotify or Netflix. So you put in a couple of choices, like, you know, I really love a rom-com or I love a, you know, scandal noir TV show, put that into Netflix, then Netflix goes, hey, you might want to review this as well. You might want to watch this show because it seems similar to what you've seen before. So that is using the algorithm of Netflix and or Spotify uh, to push through documents that it deems most relevant and most useful. So there are two different models doing the rounds. Uh, TAR 1.0 is the old school version. First came around in 2016, or at least that's when it's judicially approved. And um, you used to need to do about 10,000 docs, uh, which is obviously still a lot of documents. Um, but the uh, new version is active learning, um, which is very much like your Netflix setup, that you can have the algorithm constantly churning in the background. So every single document coding decision you make will input the uh, algorithm and help prioritize more, uh, the more relevant documents for review and potentially help you reduce your data set. Okay, so just so you can see here, judicial acceptance started in the States in 2012. Uh, Pyro Investments um, is the first recognized case in the UK, 2016, um, early 2016. Now, everyone, the e-technologists, uh, clapped their hands in Feb 2016 and like, great, this is fantastic. It will come across to Australia in a couple of years. However, uh, it actually managed to make it across to Australia within the same year in McConnell Dower Constructors. Now, uh, those are all the cases um, spread across the world and across the states. Um, it was also recognized in Money Max um, there in the federal court in 2016. Um, there's, pretty, there's not that much controversy anymore about using TAR. It's very well accepted. And as I say, a lot of the practice notes across the country are supporting the use of TAR. So, we talked about what doc review is, why you might do it. What do you actually do though? So as you can see from this little review pane here, um, when you are coding for document review, you'll code for relevance. So you do a yes, no. Uh, you'll also look at categories of relevance. So these might be driven by categories of disclosure for your own side, as well as the other parties to the documents that they've requested. So it could be, for example, minutes of meeting in 2016 pertaining to a certain uh, deal or any and all correspondence relating to that particular deal between certain parties. You also review for privilege um, and you'll review for privilege basis. So whether it's um, legal advice, whether it's litigation, whether it's without, priv without prejudice, um, all those things, those are things you'll code for. You might be coding for confidentiality, so um, looking for commercially confidential pricing or something like that that you don't want to necessarily show the other side. Um, that's usually agreed by the court as to what can be deemed confidential, commercially confidential, or hot docs. Um, so there seems to be this thinking process that every matter will have a golden, um, a, a golden document or a um, silver bullet that is the one that's going to knock the other side flat on their uh, back and um, is going to win you the case. Now, controversially, and on the other side of that, there's also the documents that are going to completely stuff your own case. So these are why you might mark documents as hot documents. They are either great for you or they're horrific for you. 
So that's one, one of why clients might choose to go to hot docs as well. But anyway, that is part of what you will do in document review on your review platform. So when should you use a review platform? Pretty much any time. So anytime you've got a lot of documents to review, this is when I would say use the review platform. So it might just be that you are looking to data call. So you might not even have a disclosure deadline yet, but you're looking to get all the information together and cut it down again. So you want to make sure you've identified all your documents and then reduce. Um, it could be that you're looking to hunt down key documents. Again, getting that story of what's happening. You know, your client told you one version of events. Now you just need the evidence to back it up. So you need the evidence and the documents to include in your witness statements, give to your experts, all that kind of thing. And also just for discovery and your discovery obligations to the court. So um, that is when you'd want to use a review platform. If you have a handful of documents, you might just want to say uh, review them manually and then have a hyperlinked index to those documents. Um, a lot of documents, um, as I say, uh, the New South Wales Practice Note recommends that if it's over 500 um, documents in an ESI format, you want to get an review platform. So really, it doesn't actually have to be an awful lot. Now, you guys are studying law. You are trying to get your head around all the law, legal stuff, what you need to do, what forms you need to fill out, how are you meant to you know, deal with clients and all the rest of it. Are you meant to know all the technology as well? Well, no. You, it's good that you guys have a flavor of what it is, hence why I'm here today. But it is also useful to know that a lot of law firms will not have this capability in house. A lot of them will, in fact, outsource this to um, outsource providers, for example, Law and Order, um, and we'll have them help them with consulting expertise, expertise in the platform, expertise in collection of data, um, and expertise in review as well. So sometimes you can actually outsource your legal review so you can have your internal team at your law firm who are doing a doc review, and you can also have external parts teams of paralegals who might do first level review for you. So don't worry, you're not meant to walk in knowing everything. However, it's really good that you have a flavor of what is uh, going to come because this is going to be a big part of law going forward. Guys, thank you for your time today. Um, if you have any questions, I'm sure you can send them through to your uh, course coordinator. But otherwise, um, enjoy the rest of your course, enjoy the rest of your semester, and uh, enjoy doc review when it comes.